Hello, I'm Toy Cat, and welcome back to another second channel video. So something people are always asking me to do is to talk about the best country in the world. I mean, everyone has this idea that there are just objective lists where you can find this, and although you can find certain indexes that try and work out the best countries, the truth is they do it in a fairly biased way that isn't going to be too fun to go through. So what if I made it way more fun by making my own index and trying to rank the worst countries in the world? That's right, I've taken the bottom 25%, or just to keep things simple, bottom 50 countries in four different categories, area, population, national wealth, and life expectancy, and then I'm going to be combining all four graphs together to work out the only countries which are in the bottom 25% of all four pretty unrelated indexes. And it's going to be kind of fun to go through, but let's start by talking about the fact that the bottom 50 countries by area, you would assume they would be heavily uh, you know, concentrated in Europe, and although Europe does have so many that you can't even see a lot of them right here, you can see how the smallest countries in the world are not in Europe. Again, having a small country is not inherently that awful by itself, but it does limit how far you can travel before leaving your country. If you live in Luxembourg, you need to leave your country on a fairly, fairly regular basis, which makes it a fairly weak in terms of defense country because of how much you rely on other countries. Same with if you look at Guyana over here, another small country. Um, same as when you look at uh, Djibouti over here or when you look at Qatar. Um, you know, leaving Qatar to go somewhere else is just an essential part of being in Qatar. And uh, that that is a downside in terms of security, I'd say. But it's also a downside in terms of it means the governments are not the most effective in terms of the land that they control. Um, similarly, population, it's one that we always have to talk about because uh, having a lot of people in a country can lead to lots of success in that country and you know leads to higher uh, results on the top end of things. Uh, a bigger market to sell to at the bare minimum, if you think economically. If you think in terms of just the you know, the success of a nation, more people means more success generally. And you can see how the smallest countries in terms of size and population don't line up anywhere nearly as much as you'd expect. That's why it's interesting to see the two on different graphs. You can see a lot of countries that do pass on both of them, but lots of countries don't even pass both of these criteria in the same way. And uh, yeah, you start to see some really big countries like Iceland, you start to see some really big countries like Estonia, um, you start to see more and more countries uh, make the list in terms of population, because uh, Iceland only has a few hundred thousand people living there as opposed to the 1.3 billion living in uh, China and India and it just puts in uh, perspective how different a scale of a country can be when it comes to uh, both size, which you can see on a map, but also population, which you generally can't. Another thing you can't see on a map is national wealth. Um, this is something you would have expected if you didn't see this map. Like, it's probably going to have an Africa heavy bent, right? And although more you know, more countries that have low national wealth are in Africa than any other continent, you can see how, for instance, Ethiopia. Um, is a wealthier nation, uh, but in terms of overall, than Mongolia is, as well as lots of other non-African countries. Um, you can see how uh, you know again the stereotype that Africa is poor is kind of outdated, and in, in my opinion, somewhat offensive. Um, uh, you know, like obviously, like just not knowing things is fine, but like when you use that as like a, a, a crutch to be like, well, that's uh, we can talk about how it's so unwealthy, but it's like it's it's not. There are very well bit doing bits of South uh, of uh, Africa, including of course South Africa. But if we leave them to the side because people say, well, they're they're an exception because something something white. It's like, no, if you look around the continent, North Africa does very well for itself. Morocco in, in particular, Egypt's another great example. But like, there are very, very successful countries in uh, Africa, and uh, that's why they can be wealthier than countries like the Mongolias of the world, or the Guyanas of the world, again, making another list, or the Haitis of the world, uh, or wherever else, uh, a lot of Pacific Islands, East Timor, sadly. Is that Brunei making this list? That's actually quite surprising. I guess like small population. Are they in the sm oh, they're in the small area and small population and small national wealth. Well, good news, Brunei doesn't make the bottom of the life expectancy list. Because you might argue, what do you care about your country's national wealth? You care much more about your own, uh, you know, like, uh, you, know, you, you don't care about how wealthy a country is, man. You don't care about how much area you have, man. I don't leave my house. I just, I just make geography videos on the internet, man. Uh, or like, you know what, population, I don't like people. And you know, I don't like people. Why do I want them to live in my country? So what you do care about is life expectancy. And this is something where it is actually just pretty damning. Almost every single country in Africa, with the exception being the relatively well off uh, by comparison north, north of Africa escapes the list. Otherwise, it is just every African country with no major exceptions. 
<laughs> which is like, again, uh, pretty, it's damning beyond belief. Uh, Yemen falls on the list. So does, if I'm not mistaken, Afghanistan. So do Laos and Cambodia and Papua New Guinea and Haiti again. Uh, but otherwise you can see this leads to a very Africa heavy bent. So what countries make all four of these lists? Uh, if you're paying attention as you go through, I wonder if you could spot that. But if you're not, you know, I don't care because here are the three countries that make the list. Three small countries by population, size, national wealth, and life expectancy. These countries are the only three in the world that you'll be in the bottom quartile, the bottom 25%. Not, not very good at four pretty important categories, wealth, health, size, and population. And uh, as a result of that, these are the three worst countries on the planet. If you're curious as to what they are, just show on a regular map because it's much easier. They are Djibouti over here. Uh, you, you might not be too familiar with it. I'm, I, most people are familiar with it just because like of people making jokes about the name, which is maybe tragic. We'll dive into them in a second. Uh, there is Comoros, a country that I, I kid you not. I once, when I was in Paris, I, uh, I've been to Paris once, by the way. I don't want to pretend like I'm in Paris other time for the weekends, but I was in Paris once and I got an Uber and uh, the woman was like, oh yeah, I'm from, uh, I'm from, you know, like these islands off the coast of Africa. And I was like, Comoros? She's like, no one knows Comoros, my God. I'm so glad I'm speaking to her. You know, that was the first time I had a French person like appreciate speaking to me. So I, I remember that story a lot. And then there's also Eswatini, which you probably more widely know as, as Swaziland because Swaziland is one of the coolest national anthems. Won't play it here because I don't want to get copy struck. But let me tell you, good national anthems come from Eswatini. And uh, so yeah, what do these three countries have in common? Because, um, you know, just calling them the worst countries, one, two, three. Um, and, you know, like trying to be like, well, they're African, right? And also they have the other four categories. And therefore, something, something, something. What happened to Africa? Wow, we're going to make some blame. But instead, let's actually talk about why these countries fail on a level that other countries don't. I mean, obviously they don't have land like the Dr. Congo has, again, DRC, Dr. C has. Uh, they, they don't have a population like uh, Nigeria has, one of the most populated countries on the earth. But what they, uh, you know, what they do have in common, uh, you might assume, is, uh, oh yeah, like they're all Islamic countries and therefore that equals bad. And uh, nope, that's not true for the record. Just want to point this one out. Eswatini is a Christian country made up of Swazis. Interestingly enough, um, they also, you might you might think like, oh yeah, because like Comoros has a lot of uh, coups happening right there and like a bad government balance, right? Because Djibouti has a similar thing. Um, Eswatini is uh, technically speaking an absolute monarchy, so arguably badly managed, but it's been a consistent absolute monarchy, so uh, not so bad on that one. But what, uh, the things they actually do have in common are that if we go on the, uh, you know, the list of sovereign states by date of formation, I don't know why I really enjoy this page, but like there's a, you can find every page by its birth of uh, sovereignty. And you can see that if we go to the newest countries in Africa, pretty close to the top of the list are all these countries. The newest one is uh, Djibouti, which is 43 years old. And the oldest one is Eswatini, a whopping 52 years old. So they're all young countries. Again, admittedly, most of them had to get their independence from another country. So they're not naturally formed countries. They're kind of put together countries. Um, and uh, you know, free countries that were kind of put together that are very small, that don't necessarily have great resources. I mean, Eswatini doesn't take a genius to work out. It's a mountain that is landlocked, but the other two countries aren't landlocked. So what's what's Comoros's problem? Well, Comoros uh, doesn't have particularly great natural resources. As you can see right here, it is, um, you know, it's a uh, particularly, not ignoring the coups, you're not, Coup, 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 coup d'etats are not good. Having your government be deposed uh, is is not good for business, generally speaking. It's advised. Um, but also if it's like, okay, but like ignoring that, it's like, what's, what's the other issues? And it's like, oh, natural resources are in short supply. And the only exports they generally do have Vanilla, clothes, perfume essence are really prone to price fluctuation. If you don't know, vanilla is wildly expensive and it's actually a really good commodity, one that they could base their economy on, but it does have huge fluctuations in price and even extraction and how much people uh, want to pay for it. There's just so many substitute goods to vanilla that it creates a real problem for making a good market for it. So there's a fun fact for you right there. Um, but yeah, also you can look at this and be like, okay, so Comoros, obviously they've got coups. They've got no natural resources and they've got the bigger problem of like their land. They consist of three islands. They're right next to France, their former colonial power. Uh, they're, uh, you know, like that. They're, they're just free islands chilling in the ocean because by the way, Mayotte uh, voted to remain part of France, which is really interesting because they split Comoros into like half its own independent state, but then one of the, three oh, quarters into an independent state. One quarter got to be its, got to be Mayotte, which is, if you don't know, just a part of France. It's like, you might be like, oh, like it's a French territory. No, I'd say it's a par France. <laughs> One of those wacky little things that maybe you enjoy. But in, in case you don't enjoy it, so Comoros, okay, they got a lot of coups and they got a turbulent history and they don't have natural resources 
And it's really hard to build infrastructure when your territory has giant, uh, you know, and I, I mean like, we're not talking like, oh, they could build a bridge there. No, there is no fundamental way to build a bridge. They need to use sea or air to get between the islands, which isn't such a great way to have a country exist across three separate islands, you know? But if you just look at the first thing, it's like, oh, it's an island. So it has limited land area in the first place, ignoring that it's one of the smallest countries. Uh, it has limited natural resources. It has very limited, uh, pretty much everything else required for economy. But like, you know, it's the only one that gets coups regularly. I mean, if we look at the other countries, we'd see that that's just the outlier, right? Well, if you look at Eswatini, it's really interesting too, because Eswatini is a country, uh, in case you're curious, it, you, want, you want to dive into it. It's a really interesting country that is like, always looks like it's on the up, but just never kind of quite is. If we, uh, cause I tried to dive into their economic history to like work out what, what's the deal there? So obviously by being entirely uh, surrounded by South Africa on most of its sides and then Mozambique on the last one, they are a landlocked nation that's kind of reliant on those trade partners. 90% of its imports come from South Africa. So that's a big problem. 60% of its exports go there. So it's very dependent on other, another country. Never a great sign. The few countries it doesn't depend on, the, 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 the countries that aren't uh, South Africa it depends on, are China and Kenya, so uh, it's not looking so great for them. And then their, their resources are pretty much, uh, you know, m mostly uh, farmed for that point. In fact, if you look at their uh, economy as rated by uh, right here, you can see how like, oh yeah, not doing so great. They've got one of the worst unemployment rates of any country. In terms of foreign direct investment, they've got one of the lowest amounts. Really low exports for a country of their size. Really low growth rate, especially for an African country. You know, this is like one of the untapped markets. It's just not growing so much. And uh, inflation is just not doing so great either. So uh, overall, the economy is just not doing great in East Bettini. And you might think, well, you know, that's accounted for a national wealth toy cat. How are they at the bottom of the, the, the life expectancy? Well, without money, and uh, we're very ununurbanized population. It's very, very spread out and uh, deurbanized. It's very hard to effectively administer healthcare, which, by the way, they don't have as much money for. Which means that uh, there is a huge, as you, you probably saw uh, right there, there is an absolutely huge uh, AIDS uh, slash HIV epidemic. Wait, where is that? Here we go. Swazi population faces major health issues. HIV, tuberculosis. Uh, that you know, <laughs> tuberculosis. It's a big problem, and I, you know. 26% of the population is HIV positive. It's a tragic uh, situation. One of the lowest life expectancies in the world. And the population is young with a median age of 20 and a half years old. Jeez, that's a lot, huh? But anyway, speaking of things that are a lot, let's go into the final example today. Because to, to Djibouti, Djibouti, it's always like, you know, DJ, like this is like a hard set of syllables for my brain to pronounce, but I'll, I'll do it. Because at least they're not making up a language, you know, anyway. <laughs> Let's let's uh, let's let's focus on Djibouti. Let's not go into bad country names. We already did that in another video. So Djibouti, you know, it's uh it's a country most people just know because oh yeah, people made fun of it that one time, and uh, you know it's it's kind of tragic that most of these countries aren't so widely known about. But anyway, so Djibouti is a really interesting country because they are in an ideal position. Like Djibouti should be a country that is on the up and up. Think about it this way: not only do they have direct control of this horn right here, like. I, the, the, the name of the horn actually escapes me, but they, they have direct control over basically all of the trade that wants to go through the Suez Canal, which is huge. So they have huge control over that, and also they are the only sea access for Ethiopia, one of Africa's fastest growing markets. In fact, if we, oh by the way, here's, here's urbanization by country, and notice how super, super, super low down on the list are, um, notice how on the list we've got like 178th Eswatini, not looking so great. And like, oh, but Comoros must be doing so much better, right? And it's like, oh, oh, yeah, where are we going to find them? 168. So really low urbanization, which is how modern economies generally work. Um, but that's not true in Djibouti. If you look at Djibouti, they are actually in the top. You know, for the first time in this video, uh, Djibouti manages to pull top 25% or I guess 27% or something. But uh, Djibouti is one of the more urbanized countries. And in fact, if you look at their population, it's very, very... Oh, Wrong map. Although this is proving that Ethiopia is a huge trading partner. By the year 2050, Ethiopia will have over 200 million people, being not only the second largest country in Africa, which they already are in terms of population, but the eighth largest in the world by population. That's huge. But look at their population density in Djibouti. Uh, you can see how it's a very centralized country around one city. It might look like the country is this size, and technically it is, but really it's one big city. And this is why it's so interesting. It's one city, it's got a well-connected trade route. It's got the ability to control trade and leverage 
uh, that to its advantage. And uh, even more interestingly than all of that, in my opinion, it's very well protected. Here are military bases in Africa. You can see how, you know what, there's no military bases in Comoros or East Batini, but there are, there's an Indian one? That's not Indian, I'm definitely making a mistake. Wait, that is an Indian military base in Madagascar which I have to dive into after this video, you can see how like, okay, there's American military bases everywhere because America likes military bases just a little bit too much. But uh, you can also see how like, oh yeah, Djibouti has the most uh, countries protecting them basically with military bases. France is a huge one because it's a former colonial power. The United States has a big one. China has their only African military base here. Germany has... Uh, a military base here. Uh, Japan has their only military base outside of Japan, or the first one outside of Japan was built right here, as well as Saudi Arabia and Italy. You can see they have so many military bases. Uh, the Horn of Africa, that is where these military bases are protecting because it's in everyone's interest that the trade flows smoothly. So it's interesting, therefore, that like, huh, well, how does the how does the country not succeed? They got they got the trade links, they got the infrastructure, they got they got the ideal favorable position. They don't have many natural resources, I'll, I'll take that away from them, but why does it not succeed? And the answer as best I can just find is, it always looks like it's just about to. Every time I read anything about it, it's like, yeah, in the next five, 10 years, Djibouti is going places, and then it just isn't. <laughs> and uh, you know, you can put that down to a lot of things, the, uh, you know, the ruling party just not taking advantage of their situation. Maybe you can, you can blame France, colonialism, am I right? It's, it's responsible for all the world's faults. Um, is is a valid point some people might make. Maybe not so valid, but uh, maybe it's down to their bad street planning. I mean, if you can't make a grid system, what what is this grid? Look at this grid system right here. I'm very offended by it. If you can't make a grid system, how are you meant to do anything else? I it's it's almost impossible to pin it down to anything. Unlike the other countries today, where it's like oh, politically unstable and no natural resources, and they're free islands in Africa. Or like, oh, landlocked, mountainous nation with a very de-urbanized population and terrible health outcomes. It's very easy to point to what is wrong in these places, right? Although, interesting enough, like, just I want to point out, because in the um, in the Somalia video, where I was talking about how dangerous um, Mogadishu is claimed to be, you know, I reckon it's a perfectly safe place, and I definitely am going to take a flight there sometime soon. But, um, you know, like, you, you might think, think of these places being so bad. I mean, it's one of the worst countries in the world. It's got to be absolutely terrible, right? But if we zoom into a random thing, this VIP club, you can see how, like, actually, it's it's not like... The the cool thing about globalization, if you will, you know, Toy Cat's defense of globalization uh, coming up in 321. The cool thing about that is, like, re even you know, the sorts of things that you might assume you have to be in a wealthy nation to see, you can see everywhere. They do have vehicles that people use to get around the country, right? Wow, that's interesting. Uh, they do have um, air airlines, look at that, Air Madagascar flies here, Air Austral flies here, pretty pretty cool stuff. They do have, there's a lot of like photo viewing things down the street for some reason. I wonder why that is. Uh, they do have, as you can see right here, a, a bustling little, what is this? There's a man wearing one of those hats. Um, oh, there's a hospital over there. That's nice. They do have healthcare. They do have... Um, people really underestimate how, like, low the bottom... You know, like, uh, again, everyone pictures, like, people living in a village with a well. And it's like, that's not how any large number of people live. Uh, lots of people live in cities like this. Not the nicest cities in the world, but they're not tragically bad. And that is, uh, I think, an important message to raise with this video. Uh, even though Djibouti is not there yet, and I don't know when it's getting there, but I pray, you know, I, Comoros, Comor Comoros, uh, however you want to say it. Uh, actually, wait, I'm saying it the way the person from Comoros said it. You know what? If you want to disagree with me, disagree with them. Get in a, get in a taxi at midnight on a random Saturday in Paris, and then, and then you can tell me that that's wrong. I think it was an Uber pool. I guess you can't get in Uber pools anymore because of coronavirus. You know, coronavirus has ruined your opportunity to speak to that woman and tell her, that I'm getting Comoros is wrong. But um, yeah, just realize that even though these are the three worst countries in the world in terms of lots of different metrics, that doesn't make them the worst country in the world in terms of every metric. There are still delightful things that happen in these places every single day, and there are still terrible things that happen in, wait, what, 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 what was, I actually never looked, what was the best country on our little leaderboard right there? Um, Canada and like Sweden. You know, it's always, it's always more Northern countries 
that score highly on this. So, you know, you might think Sweden is absolute paradise. It's, uh, or Norway. I love Norway. There's no way I can't bring that up in this video. But, um, you, you might think it's absolute paradise. But it's like, you know, there is something tragic happening right here. Yeah, cute. You know I mean, like, ignoring the the terrible-looking department store. But, like, this that, this person, look at that. She, someone's going to die in a scooter today. It's not going to be me. I wish it could be me. Man, they have scooters in Norway now. I'm so jealous. I just want to... You know, rental scooters are still only legal in certain cities in the UK. It's it's real dumb. But, you know, uh, you know I, I bet there are no rules against renting e-scooters in Comoros or Djibouti, am I right? And, uh, yeah, just a reminder, everything's relative. It's just in most ways, uh, Djibouti, uh, Iswatini, and Comoros do do be worse. But I mean, besides besides the fact that they're lowest uh, in terms of population area, national wealth, and life expectancy, great places you should totally check out. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you all enjoyed, because I'll see you all... Wait, what is this? A crossover episode? <laughs> anyway, yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you for Wayback History for making these maps, because I'll see you all next time. Goodbye. Or will I? My diner house fire. Or, even worse, my diner scooter accident. That'd suck. For the people I crash into.